Hey everyone, thank you so much for coming back and being a part of our online study. I hope that everyone had a great Thanksgiving during the last couple of weeks. We've been gone and out of town and uh, it's just a wonderful time enjoying the Thanksgiving holiday with uh, with everybody. And, uh, and so it was really fun. Uh, my family was able to get away for a, a much needed uh, reprieve and it was really, really well, uh, time well spent. We're going to move forward in our, our celebration uh Nope, sorry, I got distracted. That's what happens. Um, I've got a hole in my chest. If you're watching the video of this, uh, you are in for a real treat. Um, there are certain colors uh, that you don't want to wear when you are um, doing these kind of videos and you're recording these. Um, namely, you want to avoid the color green or things remotely re resembling green. And in the case of this one, um, even like a golden yellow is enough to make it look like I've got a hole in my chest. And so if that's a little unnerving for some of you, I'm sorry. Deal with it. Um, the good news is I'll probably have wear different colors uh, going forward. But uh, nonetheless, a fun little distracting moment. Um, like I said, I hope everyone had a really great Thanksgiving celebration. We're going to continue on in our study. Uh, we're going to move forward in our series that we've been doing, A Season of Falling. And so this is... Um, we are, we've done the intro and we've done two episodes on the nature of doctrine regarding the falling away. Um, and so we're going to continue moving forward as, as part with the online series. If any part of our study has been missed or you want to review again, the, the added benefit of having it online is that you can catch, uh, old episodes again, if needed, or for the first time, if you were, uh, had missed it. And so on our YouTube channel or the church app is where we keep all of these logged together for, for your perusal. And that we hope that you are enjoying uh, this series. In our previous session, a couple weeks back, we wrapped up our um, discussion on how doctrine plays a part in the into individuals uh, walking away from biblical truth, walking away from sound faith. And so we... We looked at those biblical uh, natures and we looked at how doctrine can play a part in that falling away. Uh, I'm going to be moving forward from doctrine into a, a really interesting area. and We're going to call that, um, it, it's what can be called uh, deconstruction. Some of you may have heard me use that phrase before outside of this study, but I'm going to kind of dive into a little bit about what deconstructionism is. Um, in this session and in the next session to come. Uh, to some of us, this term, um, this could be a new word for us. Maybe you've never heard it used this way uh, in, in light of, uh, of a theological or, or faith-based, religious-based expression. Um, so this might be new for some of you. And so I want to help uh, those of us kind of help define what that means. And, um, and so I'm going to... I want to also help you understand the word deconstruction Deconstruction uh, can mean a lot of things to a lot of people. And so for the sake of our discussion and our study, I'm going to, to give you my definition of it and also give it a pairing to another term to kind of help you understand um, my take on this particular subject. And so... Uh, let's let's look at this. So we're looking at deconstructionism. So a deconstruction is to to break something down, or to to undo, to take apart, or, or the way I have it here, to strategically destroy, to to, strategi to strategically dismantle. Uh, the whole idea is that going through a deconstruction results in these things being completely. Um, non-existent going forward in the future. And so that's the whole idea of deconstruction is a, a process and a thinking where you work yourself out of something. Okay, so, so that's the whole idea, kind of in a nutshell, what deconstruction is. It's a process and a, 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 a conscious thinking things through to work yourself out of, uh, for the sake of this conversation, out of faith. That's that's kind of what this idea of deconstruction is, and I'll I'll talk more about it as the study goes on. But I want to compare deconstruction with a term that I think is 
uh, is important, and that is going to be the term uh, detangling. So destruction is about strategic dismantling, uh, destroying, to break something down, whereas detangling is to to simplify, to, to clarify something that could be messy and you want to straighten it out. It's taking the what is right and true and absolute and removing it from things that are false. Um, or, or we can put it this way, a strategically piecing together. So, and, and I'll, I'll come back to the comparison between deconstruction and detangling, but that's kind of the, the, the starting point I want us to understand as this conversation that we're gonna be having today isn't so much about uh, detangling, we're gonna be talking about de deconstructing. Um, so I wanted to, to differentiate those terms and what I mean by those terms um, so that you, you, the viewer, the listener, have an understanding about what it means to maintain one's faith, but yet uh, removing um, excessive traditions from biblical truth. And so uh, the deconstruction is the removing of, removal of faith altogether. And I'm going to explain that as we go through this study. And so I would like to suggest that maybe up to like five or more, uh, five or so years ago, I, I had never heard the term deconstruction. It's it's a relatively, it, within the last decade, is a relatively newer term to me. It, it might have been used before then, but definitely within the last decade or so, maybe even sooner, um, that that term has really started to come out and uh, has really started making itself more well-known. Uh, I've seen it in a few uh, social media posts. I've seen uh, YouTubers um, others go through their deconstruction, um, uh, the dismantling of their faith of sorts. And so it just, it just feels like it's on the rise. And so it, it, it's gaining, it's something that's gaining popularity as I've noticed. And so I, I want to take some time to kind of go into this. Um, there's many influential leaders, uh, that have come forward with their own journey away from biblical truth. And a lot of them have used this term deconstruction. Um, and so I, wanted, I, I would venture to say that uh, in order for deconstruction to be used as they are, I, I would venture that a certain, um, there's a certain view, uh, worldview of sorts, or, or a certain perspective that takes things in. There's a certain uh, view of life that generally uh, leads into deconstruction. So I, I I want to say that deconstruction is not something like you're just going to decide to do one day. Deconstruction can be anchored in a particular worldview of sorts. And so there's a certain kind of heart condition that is intimately connected to deconstruction. And so uh, here's what the word says. So the Bible says in 1 Peter chapter 3, in 1 Peter chapter 3, uh, it's verses three through five. He says, know this, know first, know this first. Let me start over. Verse three, know this first, that there shall come scoffers in the last days who walk after their own lusts and say, where is the promise of his coming? For since the fathers fell asleep, all things have continued as they, as they were since the beginning of the creation. And in verse 5, this is Peter taking over again. He says, For they willingly ignore that by the word of God the heavens existed long ago, and the earth was formed standing out of the water and in the water. Verse 5 is kind of Peter's take on it. He goes, They willingly ignore that. By the word of God the heavens existed. Um, they're right there. He says, the, there shall come scoffers in the last days who walk after their own lusts. And then they say, where is the promise of his coming? For since these individuals passed away, all things continued as if they had been that way from the very beginning. And so that nature of scoffers, um, it, that's a mentality that creeps in. And I, I, the Bible uses scoffers, but really we can use it. Doubters, they, they, there's a, they see... The they perceive, let me put it this way, they perceive a disconnect 
from what they've grown up um, being taught in the Bible and are taught in church with with what they see in the world around them. And so they perceive a disconnect between what's happening in the world and what they were taught. And so that that creates that scoffer in there. And so and they go after their own lusts and, and more on that further on in this study. This um, this in and of itself this like where this whole idea of a scoffer or where is the promise of his coming this is the natural continuation of a thought that actually has occurred since the beginning of time um no one just arrives at that particular viewpoint uh just out of their own whim but there's actually a, a real starting uh lie that they're presented with that begins this whole process that helps someone arrive as a deconstructionist. And that, that lie is all the way found back in Genesis chapter 3. In Genesis chapter 3, he says, Now the serpent was more subtle than any beast of the field which the Lord God had made. And he said to the woman, this is what the, be the serpent said to the woman, in Genesis chapter 3, verse 1, Has God said, You shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Um, some of your other Bibles might even read, has God, did God really say you shall not eat of any tree of the garden? Um, this, this is this wonderful lie that's presented. Um, it, it creates this mentality of doubt. Did God's word really say, did God really declare and say these things? And that, that place where we, we begin to, go from a question of, I want to understand what the Bible is saying, to a question of biblical truth. I think it's okay to have questions about what is the Bible really saying and have questions about, you know, uh, to deepen our understanding of the scriptures and our understanding of what the word is teaching us. Those kind of questions are, are important and valuable and they, they help us grow in our understanding of the word. But when we take a question and the question is anchored not in understanding, but rather anchored in doubt. It's going to put us on a pathway that unless we get it checked off right away, unless we check it out first, that pathway is going to lead us to the concept of a deconstructionist. Okay. Now, we when we concluded the part on, on our study last session on doctrine, we, we were discussing the deep impacts of peer pressure. We kind of talked a little bit on peer pressure in the previous session, so make sure you, if you have missed that, make sure you catch that. It's really good. But this this idea of peer pressure actually carries on into this particular subject as well. As humanity, God has created us to be a deeply, deeply relational people. Like we're 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 designed for relationship. Important. We're designed really for good relationships. And, and in that sense, we, we lean on each other, we encourage one another, we teach one another, um, etc. We we build on our relationships with each other. For good or for ill, we we need relationships, whether it's with, with our families, with friends, with church communities. It's it's something that is ingrained into our uh, our personal health. In fact, Hebrews 10, 24 through 25 says, and let us consider how to spur one another to love and to do good works. Let us not forsake the assembling of ourselves together as is the manner of some, but let us exhort one another, especially as we see the day approaching. And so there's this, there's this wonderful uh, example for us in scriptures that we, we need to gather together to encourage one another. And so it's an important thing. It's a, it, it's very, very telling of the importance of relationships. However, what happens is that sometimes relationships uh, have a way of pressuring us away from God as well. And so we kind of touched on that a little bit um, in our previous session of doctrine. But even then, um, relationships can pressure us away from God. And so see, here's... Here's some Proverbs for us. Uh, Proverbs 13, 20. He who walks with wise men will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Uh, 
had a and I'm sure every parent's used this. I remember growing up and someone telling me this too. He's they said that if 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 all your friends were jumping off the bridge and they told you to jump too, would you do it? Um, that idea of peer pressure kicking in. And that's kind of the idea of who was walks with the wise will be wise, but a companion of fools will be destroyed. Um, Proverbs 13 in action. Proverbs 21, verse 16. The man who wanders out of the way of understanding will remain in the congregation of the dead. I think, again, just that idea of like company. In Proverbs chapter 24, do not be envious against evil men, nor desire to be with them. And so right then, we, we have these wonderful scriptures that really help paint a beautiful picture for us to help us understand the, the importance of, of having that kind of good company. Um, and if you want a passage in the New Testament, if for those of us who want to, to dive there, it's uh, in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 33, Do not be deceived. Bad company corrupts good morals. All, all that to say that when it comes to peer pressure and how that plays into things, uh, we, we, we can find this, this impact upon us um, that pressures us either to God or away from God. And in the, in the, in, in the scope of deconstruction, when we have a, a group of friends or loved ones that go through a, a deconstruction, if, if our faith is not in a convinced place and we, we allow ourselves to be in that kind of a pressure, um, it can have a very, um, that pressure, we're going to feel that to, to enter into that deconstruction mindset ourselves, and which is why we surround ourselves with people who have strong faith, who, who can encourage us and build us up uh, in our most precious faith, as the Bible says. And so if you find yourself in a group where deconstructionism is actively occurring and people are uh, de systematically um, devaluing and destroying their long-held beliefs, uh, if you value your faith, you need to make sure that you surround yourself with more people who will feed your faith and encourage it than anything else. And so it is really important there. Um, Peter gives a wonderful warning about the importance of influence by the Holy Spirit. In Second Peter chapter 3, he says, You therefore, beloved, since you know these things beforehand, Beware lest you also fall from your own firm footing, being being led away by the deception of the wicked. Like I was talking earlier, um, if you are in that company, you are warned ahead of time that these things are going to happen, and so you need to be uh, be aware. And he says in verse eighteen, "But grow in the grace and the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. To Him be glory both now and forever. Amen." And so that is. Uh, a, a very important thing for us to have and to understand. Okay. Um, he talks about the, uh, you know that these things are going to come in, um, being led away by the deception and the wicked. Some of your Bibles might not use the deception of the wicked. It might just use the deception of lawlessness. Um, whether it's lawlessness, wicked, um, the deception that is given in there. We need to understand um, what the core motivation for the wicked or the lawless is. Um, and why am I going into the core motivation? I want, again, this is about falling away. And so the, 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 what is the core there? And so the core of the lawless and the wicked, etc. as, as he says, you know, uh, in verse second, Peter three seventeen, lest you fall from your own firm footing, being led away by the deception of the wicked, so what is the core motivation of the wicked? And this core motivation of the wicked is, is actually the same core motivation of a deconstructionist. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to give you the core value, the core motivation, and, and you will see the, the, the relationship between the two. See, the core motivation before the wicked and for the deconstructionist, the core motivation is self-focused. Focus on self. This, this emphasis on self has, has been around from the very beginning, um, from the beginning of time, that this focus on what are my needs, what are my wants, 
And so it only seems right to assume that this will be a major player in the last days. It just makes complete sense to me that self is going to be that constant enemy that we're going to be dealing with here. But that self-focus is the core motivation of the wicked. It's also the core motivation of a deconstructionist. And we'll, we'll get into that. Um, now, mostly, but certainly not all, they arrive, the deconstructionists arrive um, at their point because of some belief or whether it's an issue or a conflict or a, a relationship, whatever, they, they arrive, the deconstructionists arrive at that point because of some deeply held belief or trust conflict that they are unwilling to surrender, okay? For, for example, um, the, this idea of un, unwilling to surrender a, a, a belief or unwilling to surrender um, an understanding or an issue. Um, I, I, I've, here's an example, and I've heard people put it this way. How can a loving God, how can a God, uh, a good God allow so much evil to take place in the world? Um, I mean, let's, let's take a big step and really throw a big wrench in the plans. How could a, a, a God who calls Israel his chosen people allow the the amount of conflict that is happening in the Middle East right now regarding the, the, the warfare in the Gaza and all that. And so the deconstructionists arrive, one of the conclusions of that mindset is they arrive at this conclusion that either God is all-powerful, he's just not good, or he is good, but he's not all-powerful. And so you can see that, that and that's a really common uh position that many arrive in um it's been in in films they they make it they make it they make it public without giving a decent response um and 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 really a lot of that is just a a lack of biblical understanding of who god is if you read the scriptures you can take that that question that that is presented in that example of loving god allowing bad to happen and, and the answer really in the midst of all that is that he is also a just God. And that there is um, the, the due, ben due penalties of our own free will that we, we get to endure as, uh, as we uh, encounter a just God. And so it's, uh, it's not pleasant, but God uses all things for his purposes. And um, so that's an important thing for us. Now... In regards to that, still others will take science, they'll take uh, a philosophy, and they'll, they'll take their academia as greater wisdom over what the Bible actually says. And so what then happens is this conflict that arises between, between the two. And for those who value academia over the Bible... That's that's how the winner is established. They they value the deconstructionist value um, scientific discovery, philosophical ideas, um, conscious thought, they, they, their own academic experiences, and they value those as, as having greater truth than what the Word of God declares. And so uh, that's um, what happens there. But what it all really boils down to, really. Uh, church is this um it boils down to self sitting as ruler over their heart and over their faith that's 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 really what happens is when 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 the 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 bedrock of what gives me an understanding of who god is the word of god and and how i value word of god and who what reveals the word to me all those things are right here but if I'm going to put self-discovery over the Word of God, then it is self who sits on the throne and, and uh, not, not the Word of God. And, and that's where these, these troublesome things begin to happen. Okay? And so that is an important thing there. But um, that, that self sitting on the throne, that ru sitting as ruler of our heart, um, that, that is a very key thing that happens with the deconstructionist. Um, Paul writes what kind of people, what kind of people who fill their lives with stuff, that fill their lives with, with self, and 
here's what he says in Second Timothy. In Second Timothy, he says, men will be lovers of themselves, lovers of money, boastful, proud, blasphemers, disobedient to parents, unthankful, unholy, without natural affection, truce breakers, slanderers, unrestrained, fierce, despisers of those who are good, traitors, reckless, conceited, lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God. And that's that's in 2 Timothy 3. And that that's really kind of this idea of what what does that one who has self-ruling on the throne of your heart, what becomes of it? And and that is um, 2 Timothy 3. They will be lovers of themselves, and then the whole list of what that turns into. In regards to that, listen to what Paul writes to the church in Philippi. In Philippians chapter 2, he says in verse 3, Let nothing be done out of strife or conceit. So again, instantly... Um, going right out the back and saying, okay, we're going to avoid this mess and we're going to look specifically at a uh, a non, non-self-focused non position, okay? Let nothing be done out of strife or conceit, but in humility, let each esteem the other better than himself. So take self off the throne and put it down, okay? Four. Let each of you look not only to your own interests, but also to the interests of others. And then if we jump to Philippians 2, jump all the way down to verse 21, we read this. For all seek their own, not the things of Christ Jesus. So he says, look, let nothing down a strife or conceit. In humility, uh, esteem each other better than ourselves. Let us not look at our own interests, but let us look to the interests of others. And the reason for this is because everyone is already seeking their own stuff and not the things of Christ. As Christians, I, I need to seek the things of Christ and others first beyond myself, which means they're more important, so I need to esteem them higher than me. The deconstructionist takes that position and says, well, what about my needs, my understanding, what, what I, can, I need to resolve this in my mind and, as opposed to... What, is, what do others need in that importance there? In fact, James uh, James says this, for where there is envying and strife, there is confusion in every evil work. So, so where there is envy and strife, there generates confusion and every evil work. And so uh, removing self and esteeming and promoting others beyond yourself, is, is, it is such an important thing for us to guess, to, to grasp and to understand that. The ruling of self, it, it the ruling of self creates submission issues, um, and I want us to to grab this. Um, it, it creates a certain mentality. I want what I want. When we when we are stuck in that submission issue, that selfishness automatically generates. I want what I want. Um, it gets in the way of every other healthy biblical relationship. It gets in the way of marriage. It gets in the way of raising children. It gets in the way of being uh, fully submitted unto Christ. And it's because I'm I'm in this place where I'm in the most importance. And a deconstructionist view is a very, um, regardless of what's happening, is you're taking yourself and you're putting yourself on the throne whatever you need to resolve, whatever you want to be established. And um, some deconstruction starts because of social issues, which we'll get into next week. But some of that stuff happens because there's there's a selfishness, there's a selfish desire that you're unwilling to submit to the ruling authority. When we decide to follow Christ and make him, we decide to become believers and followers of Christ. It, it's not that Christ becomes a best friend or a, a buddy buddy. Um, but it's not that kind of an exchange. When we decide to follow Christ, it's actually a, a recognition and an invitation to submit to his lordship. That's that's the essence of a Christian is I'm, I'm going to submit to his design for things. And so, again, that, that submission coming into play, um, he is the Lord. But even then, like it's not, we're not, 
we're not submitting to a harsh taskmaster. We're not submitting to somebody who's going to rule over us with an iron thumb. He, we're, we're submitting to somebody who loves us. Uh, in Ephesians, it gives a great example in Ephesians about husband, uh, wives submit unto your husbands as the church should submit unto Christ. But then he goes on and gives the even greater command. He says, husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up to her. See, this, this, this lordship that we have, that, that Christ has over us, this lordship that we're submitting to, it's not one of an iron thumb. It, it's, it's one based out of love, like a, a desire for uh, this companionship, uh, this desire for um, relationship, but it's all based from love, but he's still Lord and we still submit to him. Um, and so it's an important thing there that we recognize it's all based in love. Uh, according to this whole idea, the coin of scripture, Christ gives us this, this covenant. And, and I love the word covenant because I wanted, I wanted to help you understand the picture of covenant. It's, it's like a, con, a contracting promise. It's a contractual promise, which we put ourselves under when we decide to follow him. In, in Luke 22, he, he's given the last supper to the disciples, and he says, he the Passover supper, and he says, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood, which is shed for you. And, and that's an important thing in, in that regards there, and we get to see that, um, this covenant relationship in his blood. A, a covenant is a contract between two parties that is so important. And, and, and get this, that... Uh, What's so beautiful about this covenant is that Christ never breaks his part of the covenant promise. Um, he never breaks his part. However, when we fail to do our parts in this covenant, that's when we make mistakes. That's when we break covenant. When we, um, we breach the contract, thus is this great falling away is that we were in a contract we were in his covenant and but then we 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 violated it uh sin always violates god's covenant and i think some of the most um the dangerous parts of sin is is self and so we we must recognize that we've got to get self out of the picture and and allow god to be on the ruling of our lives and submitting all things to him. The deconstructionist says, I'm not willing to submit to God. That, that's really what it comes down to. And so this dismantling begins. As I said in the beginning, the difference between deconstruction and detangling are, are two very similar terms. Deconstruction is rooted in self and go does away. Deconstruction is rooted in self and does away with a biblical foundation. Whereas the other, the detangling, is rooted in a biblical foundation, but seeks to do away with self, hence the getting rid of traditions. And so those, those that is a, a little, maybe a little bit of an understanding of the deconstruction and where it's rooted in and what it's, uh, what the process. And, there, and, I, and the word deconstruction is such a broad application. It can be used in many different ways. And that's because everyone who's going through a deconstruction, um, what is really happening is they're wrestling with their own selfish desires and are thinking in such a process that is allowing the selfish desires to trump biblical truth. And, and that's really the core of this deconstruction um, and, and why it is such a dangerous thing. Um, but it's different because everyone who's going through a different Part, they're all wrestling with with different things whether it's they're wrestling with um lgbt they're wrestling with tithing they're wrestling with uh creation or they're wrestling with the last days or they're wrestling with um the numerous different denominations that are out there and and for whatever purposes they have their own selfish wants and desires mixed in there with all, any of those arguments but they're allowing self to trump each one of those areas and that's really the core of deconstructionism. Again, the biggest thing is to surround yourself with people of the word and of faith 
that can help build you up and strengthen you if you find yourself in such a, a company. And so that's uh, a very vital thing. Next week, we're going to talk part two of the deconstruction. There's so much more in deconstruction that we need to go into, but I wanted to keep this video as short as I could today. Thank you so much for joining us. Again, my name is Pastor Ryan, and I'm the lead pastor here at the Albert Lee Assembly God Church. If you're in the area in southern Minnesota, we'd love to have you join us. We meet in person on Sunday mornings. So Sunday school is at 9, worship is at 10, and we have public prayer a uh, prayer meeting at 6 p.m. on Sunday nights. We also have a midweek service is in person on Wednesday nights at uh, 5.30 for the Youth Cafe and then groups, age groups begin at 6.30 and we would love to have you join us for those. If you are not able to join us in the area, thank you so much for joining us online. We appreciate the online community being a part and watching these videos. Share these with your friends, like them, spread the word uh, if you find them uh, encouraging and helpful and you think other people need to listen to them as well. Also, one final little bit, if you are greatly encouraged by our online format and the ministries here that we're doing in the church and the missionaries and evangelists that we support on a regular basis, and you would like to be a part of that support, there's a giving link in the description below or the giving option in our church app, and that just helps us spread the word more and more about what God is doing and what God's plans are for our lives. Thank you so much for being a part of this study. I hope that you have a great week, and I'll see you next time. Until then, God bless.